to look out and see all my siblings in Christ. Thank you, Thalia, for your singing. Unbelievable, because God does have all of us in his hands. And to the choir who led in James, where did James go? The soul, the soul that is here. Thank you. Thank you. And then to hear you sing and to hear you proclaim the lordship of Christ through all that has happened in this world and all that's happened in this church. And it's been 10 years since I've been in this pulpit. Wow, God is faithful. And I'm so grateful to look out and see and remember the stories we have shared. As I looked in the choir, there are weddings I've performed. There are baptisms that we made the promises of God together. There are the stories of marriages that I've sat in great crisis and the moments of tremendous loss that we have shared together. And I am moved that we are part of an amazing grand story that holds us together and keeps us together. And so I chose this passage when I was invited to preach because it expresses from my heart. Paul couldn't have said it any better about how I feel about all of you. For those of you who don't know me, I've been part of this church community since I was in my mid-20s. I came here first and for 15 years was a, a layperson, just like all of you, trying to figure out who Jesus was and how to live out a Christ-centered life in all the complexities of life. It was in this church that I felt the call to ministry and was supported and mentored into that call. And by God's amazing grace was then called back and was here for 15 years in ministry together. This church is my home. It's the place where I was formed. You have been as much a part of my journey as I have been part of yours. And so when Paul writes to the church in Philippians with such love and affection, Please know this is how I feel about all of you. Let's listen for the word of God and hear God's love letter to you as spoken by the Apostle Paul, Philippians 1, verses 3 through 11. I thank my God for every remembrance of you, always in every one of my prayers for all of you, praying with joy for your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am confident of this, that the one who began a good work in you will continue to complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. And it's right for me to feel this way about you because I hold you in my heart. For you are my partners in God's grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and in the confirmation of the gospel. For as God is my witness, how I long for you with the tender affection of Christ Jesus our Lord. And this is my prayer, that your love may overflow with more and more knowledge and full insight to help you determine what really matters so that in the day of Christ you may be pure and blameless, having produced the harvest of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ for the glory and praise of God. For me in my formation as a Christian, not in my formation as a pastor, because I think that's a, a calling that God has given, but my first calling is simply to be a Christian and to be a Christ follower, just as all of you. And just because I may have some theological training stuff, it doesn't mean that my journey of faith is any less challenging than yours. There have been moments in the dark night of the soul where I doubted that God even existed. There have been moments in my life where I wondered why it seemed the blessing of God was withdrawn from me. And there are moments of tremendous joy that have just brought my spirit into places of elation that I can't even imagine, and the praise of God just pours out from my lips. And there have been moments when it's just been 
same old, same old faith. And it doesn't actually seem like following Jesus makes much difference, and there have been moments when I really could have cared less. And yet, I have always known, in part of being part of this community of faith, that there was a story bigger than my own. You see, the foundational story of our faith is that all of history, all of life, all of creation centers in the revelation of God revealed in Jesus Christ and at the beginning of the day, at the middle of the day, at the end of the day, in the journey that has all its sideways ups and downs. It's that story of Jesus, that engagement with him that is the most foundational story of my life, our life, of human history. It's that foundational story that we don't even know the, the extent or the complexities of who this Jesus person is, who this God of love and grace can possibly be. It's a story that as we begin it as children only can expand, can only get larger, can only get bigger, and our understanding can only be more limited because of the more we know, the more we don't know. But we have the assurance that Christ at the center makes a difference. I love the fact that at first pres in my formation, I was always clear that it was Christ that we were centered on. It was this foundational story that we pointed to. It meant that we didn't have to defend Christ with, uh, if people said they didn't believe or had doubts because we just had to point you and encourage you to engage in that story and let Christ speak for himself. It was a story that said there can't be boundaries that make the church about who's in and who's out by particular doctrines or beliefs or by the way that we uh, looked or the people that we loved or the culture that we came from. And while we weren't always perfect as a church, there was a movement of expansion that said, as long as we follow Christ, who is Christ telling us to be, showing us to be, inviting us to be out in the community? It was clear. It was foundational. And that was the thing that has anchored my life because of you, the community of faith. The most profound conversations about faith have often happened not because I heard a tremendous sermon, although, as you know, the preaching here is phenomenal. It didn't come from professional pastors or people who are professional Christians. It came from ordinary people like you. I remember in my own life, as often as we do, we take the Christian story and then we want to contain it and we want to um, manage it. And then we want to make sure that certainty is the most important thing, that we're, we've got it all clear. And we take that same sense of certainty and mastery over a story, and we often impose it on other people. You see, our stories matter, but often in our youth, we think the only story that is most important is the one that keeps us together at a particular time. I'll never forget having a conversation with a, a dear sister in Christ who, in my opinion, had it all together. Wonderful marriage, tremendous career. And I put those assumptions on her. And I remember her saying to me, why have you made those assumptions that my life has always been easy? I came to Christ through the fire. You have never taken the time to ask me about my story. And then when we did talk about that story, there was so much heartache and so much brokenness. And her story was a story of how and being a Christ follower transformed her life. It was in that moment that I began to realize that there is a danger when we make our story the singular story. Whether it's the story of our victimization or our pain or our culture or our country or whatever, there is a danger when we try to take our own stories and manage it down and that's the only story that matters. But at first pres, I began to be invited by people like you as you shared your stories to realize there was a diversity of stories and there was a danger if we only adhered to one story. I remember the time when uh, about 30 years ago they started a racial reconciliation committee here. As someone who had always been interested in, in social justice, I was very eager to join that group. But I was told by the leaders that I couldn't come because I was white. 
And I remember feeling so excluded and so angry. And then I listened to what they needed to do and how they needed to organize themselves and why they needed a safe space. And while they didn't sting quite as much, the real transformation of those kinds of questions of not narrowing my understanding of them to a single story, but also I had to break open my assumptions about myself. It was that beginning of that group and the beginning of those kinds of questions and an open-heartedness that comes with sharing a diversity of stories that I had to begin to deconstruct my own white privilege. It was painful. It still is painful. And yet there is value and richness in those of us who belong to Christ, the membership things that we say, you belong to Jesus because you belong to Jesus, you belong to me and we belong to you. And we're going to work this out as we point ourselves and find ourselves in Christ. And that means that when the stories conflict, the narratives wound, we can find the grace in Christ to come together. There's probably no um, da more dangerous narrative going on right now politically than the narratives going over the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. Our world is obsessed with one narrative or the other. And yet I think Christ calls us to listen to both narratives. Not to say that justice is equal, but to listen deeply to the stories of others. As many of you know, I've been involved in the Palestinian-Israeli um, world for many, many years. It was at First Pres that I first began to engage more seriously with Christian Palestinians after a conference where we hosted a Palestinian theologian. I've been to the Holy Land dozens of times. I live there on sabbatical. The relationships I have there are deep. But it's interesting to me that as I have worked this through, and I'm not still working it through, as all of us are, that there is a danger in only listening to one side, to not understanding the narrative of the other. Even if you disagree with what their conclusions are or their reasons for why they got where they are, it's still important to listen and to value and to see our humanity in each other. And out of that struggle, that painful struggle, to begin to understand and hear from the voices of people who are on the ground. Since October 7th, there has not been a week that I haven't been in touch with people in the Holy Land. Usually three, four, or five times a week, I'm on the phone with people that I care about and that I love there. And I can tell you that it is a very unsettling time for Jewish Israelis, for Arab Israelis, certainly for the Palestinians and for those in Gaza. Imagine if you are a Christian in Gaza. There are less than a thousand Christians in Gaza. There are only two churches in Gaza, a Catholic church and a Greek Orthodox church, both of which have been bombed early in the conflict and because of their location in the north are facing incredible dire circumstances. And yet, last Sunday, it was Easter there. And do you know what their message was? Hope. Not optimism. Hope. Their hope is in that grand story of Christ. They have no illusions that they are expendable and that their story, personal story, may not continue. In fact, it's more likely than not that they will not survive the conflict. Not all of them, not all of their families. And yet they speak of a hope in Christ. He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion in the day of Christ. They see their story rooted in a story that goes back to the beginning of time and will continue by the grace of God. And whether or not their story gets resolved in the ways that they hope and wish, and believe me, they do wish for things to change. Their hope is in Christ. It's in that larger story. 
The danger of the single story in their case would be to equate their faith with the fulfillment of justice in their time. For them, justice is what they pray for, they long for, and they work for, but their faith is solidly in Christ. Over these last 24 hours or 48 hours that I've been here in Berkeley, I've met with many, many of my dear, deep friends, many people that I have been in ministry with, people that I care about, and even people I had never met before, but who had arranged to meet with me. And the stories are hard. The challenges are real. The circumstances that people face are at times debilitating. And yet, as I sat with my Bible study of 25 years, a study that I started long before I was a Christian and met together, there was something really interesting that I observed. One would share where they are, and in that moment, everyone was attuned, praying, living in the pain with them. And while the person who may have been sharing couldn't really see their way out of whatever was going on, you could tell that the group saw Christ and gave hope for them. And then it would move to the next person who would share, and there may be another set of challenges. And again, focused on the story that they're telling and the pain that is there, or the challenges that are being lifted up. And the group is just holding this person, not because they can solve or manage the problem, but simply because they can hold them before Christ. That story of the men who uh, dig through the ceiling and bring the paralytic down before Christ, that's what it's all about, pointing to that bigger story. Because I, the other people in that group, none of us can solve and manage and take away the challenges of life. There's not one of us in this room, no matter how much we speak for justice, and well, we should, and we should stand on the right of those who are marginalized. We can never make the change on our own. It is only as a community of faith, the one who began a good work in us, not just in me, but in us, holding those challenges in the hope God is here, and God will continue to hold us as God has from the beginning of time through our circumstances now and beyond. Friends, Paul writes, he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. You will grow. You will struggle. You will be carried you will be loved, you will be forgiven, you will blow it, and yet Christ is there all the way through. And so this is the generative prayer that Paul has for the Philippian church and the prayer that I have for you. Don't let your love get stuck. Don't let yourself get so locked into a single narrative of what belief is or what life should be, or who God is, but instead allow Christ to be expansive and enlarge your worldview and enlarge the love and grace that you need to expect. And may out of that, may your love overflow, become even more abundant, even more evident, so that we may come into maturity into Christ. Amen.